Okay, so I got kind of cut off on that last one, which is fine. Um, this was uh, his parents' barn, and um, he had another barn on the other side of basically a railroad bed, and I found out who to call, and I called him, and I asked about availability. I asked about whether or not I can bring a young stallion there, because Ritz was not gelded yet, and I didn't have any intention of gelding him right away, because at the time, the Tennessee Walker Registry uh, said that he was um, the great-grandson of the tallest, most muscular Tennessee Walker at the time. So I had decided that I'm going to allow him to stay intact for at least till he was two, to make sure that he had the ability to take as much advantage of testosterone as he could before I had him gelded so that way he could develop the height that he was intended to develop, he could develop the muscularity uh, he was intended to develop if he had been kept a stallion. Um, so that, that was one of the important questions I asked the fellow because I really was not going to geld him and he was not gelded at the time. And that was not a problem. So uh, I made arrangements to have a buddy of mine trailer Ritz over, and we made our move. Um, Ritz moved into a really nice, um, well, much better than a uh, backyard facility that he was coming from. And uh, it was very private at the time. I believe it's really kind of turned into a, an active riding barn now as far as lessons and things, but that was not what was going on at this time. It was very much the backyard version of the fellow's other barn, which at the time I read a write-up saying that it was the largest indoor arena uh, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and we, we had access to it. We were allowed to go over there and use it, but we had our own arena at his other farm and we were able to um, really take advantage of the privacy of that farm but then take advantage if we wanted to the um, amenities of the bigger barn. I never, I don't know if I ever even took Ritz over there, maybe you know on a trail I took him over there once or something you know walking. Uh, I did a lot of hand work with Ritz while we were there. I had a lot of private time with him, which you'll see in some of his young videos. There was a lot of private time, a lot of time where I had use of the entire arena just for us. And, um, you know, got to play games of like, you know, dragging the tarp around and running around like a crazy person, but playing with him like he thought he was a cat. He would chase me with the tarp and leap on the tarp to try to stop, you know, you know, he'd pounce on the tarp and very, very cute video and it, it's available to you to see. Um, did a lot of really, really great groundwork with him and a lot of fun stuff we did. And in doing so, it attracted people um, to watch. It attracted people to um, want to aspire to have that relationship with their horse. And therefore, it attracted people to inquire if I would be interested in helping them achieve that relationship with their horses. Um, at the time, I was not interested in working with people, and I made it kind of clear that I, I, I didn't have good people skills, and, and I would get easily frustrated with people, and, you know, I had learned that through my uh, dog training years. I trained dogs for a while, and the only reason that I stopped training dogs was because I couldn't train the owners. The dogs would behave perfectly at my home, and then they'd go home, and, you know, I'd hear that, you know, the dog wasn't doing this at their house, and things like that, and... It just was very frustrating to me to send a trained dog home and know that he was not going to stay trained once he was home because of the way his environment with his owner um, was and, and just it wasn't going to be something that I wanted to keep. I kept feeling like I was failing the dog because I was giving him um, you know, jobs and, and, and responsibilities and then the owners would take them home and they wouldn't follow through on keeping it black and white and they would offer a lot of gray areas and you know one of the most valuable things I was ever told by my mother was um, dogs don't understand sometimes 
So if it's not okay to do it today, it's not okay to do it tomorrow. And, and if you want your animal to always respect the rules, the rules have to be black and white. So that became a very strong teaching uh, statement that I make to people uh, when I'm working with horses now. So I quit working with dogs for that reason because I couldn't work with people. Couldn't explain to people the importance of black and white. And I had decided that it must just be my inability to work with people in general. So I stopped working with people altogether and had said in my interest of working with horses, I would love to continue, uh, pick up my career in training horses because I had trained horses prior to leaving horses and, and putting them kind of on the back burner of my life. Um, and I, I was training horses at a very young age and I really did love it. But, like I said, it just was something that just didn't fit into my life for a little while. Um, so I, I was very interested in training horses again. Now this is still, I know it's a story about me, but it's more of a story that, you know, because of Ritz, this is why Ritz became the horse he is and why I'm where I am because of him. So Ritz is what we would call the face of the company. He is the reason this company started. Um, took on some training horses jobs, but I had two women at that barn um, convince me that they, they could handle my lack of people patience and lack of people skills, and they would, they would do everything I told them to do, and, and it was important to them before they really, really did appreciate the relationship I had with Ritz, and if it was achievable for them to have that relationship, um, they definitely, uh, wanted to do whatever I said would work. And um, so they did. Uh, they were the first people that I ever trained with horses. I did have some other like working with horses jobs. And then one day when I was playing with Ritz, I was doing, you know, Ritz was very, very advanced for his age. So say 11, 12 months old, I was uh, already long lining him while he packed a saddle. Of course, I never sat in the saddle when he was 12 months old, but I, I allowed him to wear my synthetic 13 pound saddle and um, I allowed him to uh, have long lines attached to him and, and he could uh, be steered from a driving position um, as if I was steering him from a cart. And that's what long lining is, if you don't know what long lining is or, or um, what do you call it, ground driving. So uh, I did a lot of that. Well, this one day, and this is again still a writ story, I was doing that in front of the owner of both barns, and he happened to be there because he was burning brush or he was burning old fencing or something, and he had to stay, you know, a supervisor for this, this fire. He wasn't allowed to leave the fire, so he had no choice but to sit there and watch me, so why not take advantage of that opportunity and see if I can't promote myself a little bit, because now that's my, you know, kind of my calling, right? So I set up a little obstacle course for Ritz, and I do a, a ground driving exercise through an obstacle course with Ritz, and, uh, and you know, he's packing the saddle and whatever, and, and there's patience and, and whatever it was that he saw that he liked and he offered me to work with some of the babies that he has over at his other farm. He bred his mares and um, you know he wanted me to work with some of the young horses that were over at his other side. That was the beginning of my um, colt starting program. I started some horses for him um, and you know really took advantage of every opportunity I had to kind of be seen and, um, you know, I worked with quite a few horses before uh, I had met and, and befriended a neighbor of my side of the barn who was a breeder of thoroughbreds for racing. And he, you know, one day, July, it was July 4th, he wanted to, um, we talked over the July 4th celebration about how um, he would love to have New York bred horses and, and you know, because I guess that gives them more uh, track rights or something and, and I don't know anything about racing but I just knew that I wanted to help him, you know, 
raise horses in the state of New York. I was happy to be his his person, you know. So, you know, we, we said we were going to do this, and I went, and I, you know, July 5th, I was on the internet looking for um, opportunities, uh, lease opportunities for facilities to to do both, you know, to do that for him, and then to maybe start my own training facility. Again, I was not into the people thing, so I was not opening a boarding facility, I was opening a training facility. And I found this great place, I fell in love, I walked in, and I, all I could say was yes please. And when I decided that this was the place I wanted, I went back and I told the gentleman that, you know, I found a place, and uh, the price was too much for him, and he backed out. Um, but I had already fallen in love, and kind of like when I met Ritz, I said, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? I'll figure it out. How am I going to do this? And I figured it out. I signed a lease August 2007. No, yeah, August 2007. And um, kind of my move to New York was... Uh, September 1st, and uh, that's where I began training horses using Ritz as my, kind of my, my bait, you know, my demonstration horse. This is what I can do with horses. I have this two-year-old that can do call all kinds of cool things. Uh, he lays down and rolls when I tell him to. Um, he does, you know, he does cool things, and, you know, everybody look. <laughs> So for two months there, it was kind of a lonely two months. It was me and an eight stall barn and Ritz. Um, and then December 15th, I had done enough of advertising, I guess, and going around and knocking on doors. And, and I was able to acquire two new clients. And then those clients became repeat clients and they told people and so, so on and so on. So, uh, after a year at that barn, I also acquired the barn I'm in now. I was running back and forth between two barns, which you don't think 12 miles is a big deal until 12 miles is done twice a day, every day, and work needs to be done at both locations. It became very draining, it came, became very difficult. So I did that for 10 months, and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I packed up everything from this barn and moved back to that barn with the intention of you know, taking advantage of the amenities of a nice facility. Um, I missed making my own rules about everything. Like that facility, they were concerned about um, uh, pasture appearance. So horses weren't allowed out for days if the pastures were wet. Um, they, you know, they rotated their horses in and out of the indoor arena to give their horses, you know, 20 minutes of running. And they did, they ran the horses. Um, and I ended up having to do that starting at 9 o'clock at night and I allowed my horses time in the arena um, to get their exercise or whatever because I was having to follow the rules of that farm and yet they weren't making uh, time slots available because they had so many horses uh, for me to be able to access the arena at any earlier point in the time. So there were actually days that I was running my horses, if you will, at two o'clock in the morning because we were preserving paddocks. I get it, you know, I do get it. It's, it's not, I'm not complaining, but um, I missed having the opportunity to have sacrifice paddocks, um, to have a paddock that you know you're going to repair in the spring, you're gonna reseed in the spring, but your horses can at least go outside. If it's 60 degrees, the sun is out, and it rained two days uh, prior to that day, but they need to get out, you know, they need to get out. So I have sacrificial paddocks and I know I just have to repair them. Um, so I was gone for two months and apparently I had really impressed my landlord at this location and uh, they called me one day after I was gone already and asked if I would be willing to go out to dinner with them. They wanted to just take me out to dinner and, uh, and as a form of appreciation for the type of tenant I had been. I was gone, you know. Um, I've, of course, they were very, they were lovely people, and yes, I will definitely take you up on that. So we went out to dinner. We had a lovely dinner, and there was no motivation. There was no. 
they weren't taking me out to try to sell me the barn. They weren't taking me out to try to do anything. They took me out because they wanted to tell me they appreciated all that I did while I lived at that barn or while I kept horses at that barn. And that's all it was. It was just a thank you. It was amazing. Um, so that I was like, you know, you have that moment where you're like, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm packing up everything from this lovely facility with amenities galore and views and things that, you know, you're not going to get everywhere and said, I'm leaving. I'm going to go over to this place where I'm definitely appreciated and um, I'm going to go make a go of that place and see, I mean, it didn't have an arena, it didn't have a round pen, um, it, it didn't have the, the paddock um, construction that I have created here now, but um, it was worth going and seeing what I can make of that place. So that's what I did. And that's where we are now. And like I said, Ritz is the face of the company. Ritz has become a school horse, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately for him, you know, he was my boy. You know, when he was two, I proved that my training, um, proved to myself anyway, that my training was valuable because at two years old, I entered him into one of that other farm's uh, horse shows. They had a lot of shows. And um, his very first show, he was two years old. We won reserve champion, you know, so I can't complain. Uh, I didn't plan on making him a show horse. I just wanted to, it was almost like a validation for myself that I was able to create a beautiful little show horse. Um, I moved here, decided Ritz is going to have to have a job because I'm going to have to branch out a little bit now and, and, and offer riding. And I really, 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 really was reluctant to do that because I believe in a lot of groundwork and I believe in a lot of um, time to spend connecting to the horse uh, before you should ever be sitting on them. You know, if I can't tell my horse where to put his feet when I'm standing next to him, I really should not be on his back. And I do believe that I would never bring you here and put you up on my horse. I just wouldn't do that. And, and there's people that... Um, were here for long periods of time before they ever sat on my horse. Um, I have children that you know are in their second year of my program and now they're starting to ride. Uh, Ritz is still a comedian. Ritz has turned out to be one of the best instructors I've ever had. I have a young pony or I have a pony, a small pony, that um, is an incredible teacher as well. But Ritz is definitely the best riding teacher he will tell you what you don't know. And I don't care who you are, how long you've been riding, my horse is gonna tell me, because he's gonna tell you, what you're doing wrong. So let's just say you're an off-balanced rider, let's say if you sit a lot harder to your right or a lot harder to your left, you know, like let's just say that you sit a certain way on your horse that feels comfortable to you, but you don't understand that it's not balanced. You actually are leaning a little bit more to the left or to the right. Um, Ritz is going to tell you that. He's going to respond to the pressure in the saddle. You're not going to want that to be what he does, so you're going to correct him. And then he, it's almost like he just throws down the, the, you know, like he's carrying a school books or something, and he throws down the books and is like, then what do you want? You know, like, and he'll be like, because you're telling me, and he'll show you what you're doing, because you're telling me to do that, but you're telling me I'm wrong for listening to you. So what do you want me to do? Um, he's actually a fantastic, fantastic teacher. He teaches people how little control they have. Um, we call him Kirsten Sauer. When I'm in the arena, I walk a lot with my students, um, and he is very focused on me, of course, um, but he's also knowing he's supposed to listen to them. But when people first start riding him, they see just how little control they would have in a trail experience or a horse that's barn sour, um, because he's, he's not aggressive about it. He doesn't run to me, but he very passively brings that rider to me. It's always a joke, don't run me over, don't run me over, don't run me over. Um, 
Ritz is very Kirsten Sauer, but as my riders begin to really develop a relationship with Ritz, he's more likely to listen to them on a further distance. And the funny thing is, is it just clicked to me that I'm teaching my students how to be who I was when Ritz was a baby, and I tried to get him to draw away from his mom and be with me and not need to be so close to his mom. And it's funny now that I actually just made that connection in this moment that that's exactly what these riders are learning. They're learning how to be what he needs so he can disconnect from me and be okay with you. He's such a good teacher. He really is. He's an amazing, amazing horse. Um, so funny, you know. You, you, if you ever thought horses were dull or, or cookie cutter type animals, he's got the greatest personality. Um, I would invite anybody to just come meet him. You know, if you want to learn about horses and you want to learn about horse dynamics and herd dynamics and and how horses communicate and how horses, he's so animated that there's no way you don't, if you want to take the time to stop and listen, there's no way you don't hear what he's doing. There's no way you don't hear what he's telling you. And it, it's amazing, actually. And he's an amazing, amazing teacher. Um, I invite anybody to give me a call. Come meet Ritz. Uh, I have other horses you can certainly meet, but Ritz is definitely a good attraction. Um, and he's, he's the reason I'm where I am right now. Uh, it's a long journey to get here. He's 12 now, so it's been a 12-year journey. But um, I'm pretty glad that I called in that radio station that day. So that's Ritz's story. That's where we are.